Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning (coughs) comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, and I will be reading verses 25 through 37 from the New International Version of the Bible. This is a different scripture than what's in your bulletin, so don't freak out. I'm keeping you on your toes. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength, and all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. And the expert, wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going on the same road And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too did a Levite when he came to the place and saw him. He also passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Please look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that he might have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell at the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus answered, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, we started our summer series entitled, It is a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Spiritual Wisdom from Fred Rogers. And I love our altar with all of the wonderful decor that Antonia has done for us. If you come up after service, you can even see the neighborhood trolley and all of the puppets, which I love so much. It just looks wonderful. In each week of this series, we will be looking at different lessons Fred taught us on his popular children's show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Now, I think it's important to note that being a television star wasn't something Fred ever aspired to do. He wasn't interested in fame or fortune. He actually wanted to be a pastor in a local church for most of his life. But one summer during seminary, He came home to visit his parents, and he saw that they bought this new device, a television. Never having watched television, Fred sat down to see what it was all about. And he witnessed a lot of shows that had mean behavior like pies being thrown in faces and lots of war and violence and consumerism, people trying to sell you stuff. This made Fred sad because he thought... Children all over America are going to be watching these shows. I wish they would have a program that would nurture and support them, especially as they transition through all the seasons of their lives. So, after he finished seminary, Fred was ordained a Presbyterian minister with a special extension appointment to television ministry. And Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood ran for 33 years ministering to the lives of countless young people. And every episode started the exact same way, with Fred entering his home, singing the song, Won't You Be My Neighbor. The song went like this. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Now, he would also put on, thank you, thank you. 
He would also put on his red sweater usually and his shoes and he would feed his fish, but the song was always sung. Following the song, Mr. Rogers would visit various people in the neighborhood of make-believe and in his own neighborhood where various people had different occupations and interests. The point was always love, acceptance, and inclusion. They didn't have to be the same to be neighbors, and everyone was invited to be a part of the neighborhood. At the end of every show, Fred's goal was for the viewer to go and be a good neighbor wherever they were. Now we hear a lot about neighbors in our scripture reading this morning. This is why I chose this scripture instead of the one in the bulletin. The story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most familiar parables in all of the Bible, and I know it's a favorite of many here. But the problem with parables, when we get too comfortable with them, is we stop letting them work on us. Parables are supposed to challenge us and make us kind of squirm in our seats a little bit. That's why Jesus told them. So if we're not finding this parable challenging, we might need to listen again. So I will retell it a little bit different way, and I pray that the Spirit would speak something new to each one of us. This expert in the Jewish law was questioning Jesus at the beginning of our passage, asking him questions in an attempt to make himself look good and Jesus look bad. This expert in the law would have known all 613 commandments backwards and forwards, so he wasn't looking for any answers or to learn anything. He just wanted to trap Jesus theologically. So he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to get to heaven? And Jesus answers with another question, well, what's written in the law? And we hear this wonderful phrase, the two commandments that all other commandments hang on. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two most important commandments. But the expert was not happy because he hadn't gotten Jesus where he wanted him. So he baits him further and says, well, just who is my neighbor? Prompting Jesus to tell this parable. A man was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho and gets beaten up and left for dead by a gang of robbers. A priest walks by, a you know, modern day pastor, sees the man in need, and does nothing. The priest would have spent his days in the temple teaching about the importance of justice and mercy, but when the opportunity arose for him to actually live out what he was teaching, he did nothing. Then we read about a Levite who would have been a modern-day church leader walking by, seeing the man, and he too does nothing. He would have spent his days reminding others to take care of the poor, the oppressed, and love the stranger. But when no one was around, and maybe it was a little inconvenient, he passed on the other side of the road. You could see how this part of the parable would sting for an expert in the law to hear. Because the parable is clearly calling out so many religious people at the time especially the leaders. People knew the scriptures and they knew exactly what right things to say, but more often than not, Jesus knew they were neglecting ministry opportunities right in front of them. And this parable is just as convicting to me. Because how many times do I pass by ministry because it's too messy or tiresome or inconvenient or uncomfortable. I read an article this week on how people choose to help or not help when situations arise, and a psychologist called this the bystander effect, saying the decision to help always comes down to three main factors. The first factor is whether or not we feel the person is deserving of our help. If we see someone in need and we think, no, that person got themselves into that mess. Or, no, I know that person's past and what they've done. 
we're not as likely to help them because we judge them and believe they don't deserve it. The second factor is the competence of the bystander. When we see a need in front of us and we feel like we can participate in the solution, we are more likely to help. For example, if someone's car is broken down on the side of the road with a flat tire and we think to ourselves, well, I know how to change a flat tire, we're more likely to pull over and help them out. But if we see a child choking and we don't know the proper measures to take to get the food out of the child's throat, we are more likely to freeze. Confidence is a huge factor on whether we come and intervene or not. The final factor is whether we can relate to the person or not. If we can relate easily to someone we see in need of help, we're more likely to step in. If a young mom is on the side of the road needing help and her kids are crying, we're more likely to stop because maybe we're a young mom and we can relate. If there's somebody on the side of the road with a sign with a dog and we have dogs, we're more inclined to roll down the window and give them assistance. If we apply these three factors to the priest and the Levite in the parable, I would imagine that they could have related to the man and empathized with the dangers of roadside travel at this time in the ancient world. But my guess is both the priest and the Levite assumed that the man got what was coming to him. They didn't believe he was worthy of being helped because a common theological belief at that time was that people in tragic situations must have done something sinful to deserve that kind of punishment. So they just kept walking. But then Jesus does something wild in the parable and he adds a hero to the story, a Samaritan. This was wild for him to do because Jewish people hated the Samaritans. They were seen as half-breeds, mongrels. The hatred was so bad that in the Jewish Talmud, rabbis would say that Jewish people should never eat with Samaritans or even come in close proximity to them because they would be defiled. Samaritans were seen as perpetually unclean and coming near them would make you unclean too. Yet Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, is saying that the Samaritan is the one that stopped and had compassion on the man in the ditch. The Samaritan picks him up, places him on a donkey, takes him to an inn, and pays for all of his food, lodging, and care. So the one that goes above and beyond, the neighbor in the story, is the sworn enemy of the Jewish people at that time. There was so much disdain for Samaritans, you'll even notice that the Jewish expert in the law doesn't even say the word Samaritan. When Jesus asked him, who was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The man could only get out the one who had mercy on him. That's the point of the parable. We don't get to pick who our neighbor is. Everyone, even our enemies, even the people who when we say their name, it makes our blood boil, are our neighbor. You see, too often we are just like the religious expert in the law where we want to pat ourselves on the back and say we're a good neighbor, but it's usually to the people we believe deserve our help, or the people we can relate to, or the people we feel comfortable with. It's a lot harder to neighbor those who are radically different than us, the people we don't understand, the people that push us out of our comfort zones, the people that maybe even frustrate us. I've been reading a book that goes along with this series called The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers by Amy Hollingsworth. Highly recommended, it's on Amazon. And in this book, the author talks about how the parable of the Good Samaritan was truly the heartbeat of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. 
Fred was all about introducing his audience to various neighbors. There was King Friday, who was often grumpy and afraid of change. There was Daniel Tiger, who was scared and struggled with all of the changes in his emotions. There was Officer Clemens, a friendly black police officer who visited Mr. Rogers quite often, and Lady Aberlin, who played the wise old sister to many in the land of make-believe. Everyone in the neighborhood was different, but everyone learned to love and support one another. Amy Hollingsworth said, at the center of Fred's theology of loving your neighbor was this. Every person is made in the image of God, and for that reason alone, everyone should be valued and appreciated. Now, that's a wonderful sentiment in theory, but if I'm honest, especially on my bad days, it's difficult for me to faithfully live out because people are hard, especially when I used to live in Denver and I would sit in traffic with those people. It was awful. <laughs> so how can we have compassion and love for everyone we encounter when there are people that we struggle to relate to or understand? How can we neighbor those who simply anger us? The foundation for Fred's understanding of how to love our neighbors well came from his professor and beloved mentor, Dr. William Orr. Fred learned many lessons from Dr. Orr, but one of the most important is the lens that we see our neighbors stems from the way we view ourselves. Evil is on one side of the spectrum. Evil is the accuser, and evil would love nothing more for us to feel awful about who we are. And then when we look through that eye and that lens at our neighbors, we only see what's awful about them. In fact, we look for it. But on the other side of the accuser is Jesus our advocate. And our advocate, Jesus, wants us to feel as good as possible about God's creation inside of us, about the beautiful ways that God has gifted us. And when we look through those eyes, we can see what's wonderful about our neighbor. We look for the good during his ministry, Fred encountered lots of difficult people, people that tried to trap him and bait him, people that were convinced he was a fraud. They were judgmental. Many were critical and cruel of his work. But with every one of those interactions, Fred always sought the good. He celebrated people for their positive qualities, even if he was the only person that could see those qualities. And when he did this, people changed. They were transformed. Because you see, it's hard to stay a nasty, grumpy person if someone is being genuinely kind and compassionate to you in response. Try it, it's true. Fred also said he never met a person he didn't love and he didn't consider his neighbor. We can't choose our neighbors, but we can choose how we will treat them. So this week, I want to challenge all of us, especially the pastor, to think of the Samaritans in our lives. Those people that make us crazy. Those people we don't understand. The people we'd rather live without. It's easy for us to look at those difficult people in our lives with the lens of constant criticism and judgment. But as Christ followers, we are called to do better. We are called to seek the best in everyone and love them as Jesus loves us. Fred would often say, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's so easy to say, it's not my child, it's not my community, it's not my problem. But then, there are those who see the needs in our world and they respond, I consider those people my heroes. I don't know about you, but I would love to be one of Fred Rogers' heroes. 
a person who sees the needs in the community and doesn't just ignore them, but takes action. A person who advocates for the least of these and uses their power and privilege for good. A person that loves the seemingly unlovable and includes them at the table. We have the opportunity to create that kind of neighborhood here. And it starts with loving ourselves and allowing that transformative love to spill out into how we see and treat others. It's not easy work, but it is the kind of neighborhood that God dreams for us. One where people love themselves, love each other, and love God with all of their heart. So may we go forth and neighbor well this week. Amen.